have you ever wanted to do an OSINT training experience, but not wanted to sit necessarily in a classroom listening to someone as ugly as me or as monotone as me tell you all about OSINT? Hmm. If only there was a platform for that. Ray, do you know anything about that? I would suggest case scenarios. <laughs> case scenarios is an immersive training experience, I would say, for learning real world OSINT work in a fun, true crime focused kind of environment that focuses on real life issues and real life experiences that you would have. How's it going, everyone? It's going good. Ready to talk about case. Yes, let's talk about case because that definitely was a big uh, mouthful. Just kicking it off, obviously, I provide one type of training. You're providing a completely different type of training. And, you know, it's not an us versus them thing. This is just proof that there could and should be collaboration within the training world. Tell me and tell the audience about what prompted you to create case any frustrations and deficiencies that you saw leading into creating case scenarios sure so first what what case scenarios is really is I, i'm a huge true crime fan so that that's what draws me into this um i like that the platform is like a realistic uh, training platform um, it's supposed to be immersive. It's supposed to feel like a real investigation. Um, our first scenario that we just put out called Dark Waters, it focuses on a journalist who's trying to uncover what is happening in a small town. It's It got videos, it has audio, it has pictures um, mixed with um, questions, puzzles that prompt you to perform OSINT techniques. So you're learning these OSINT techniques while also kind of being entertained by a story and experiencing what it would be like to work kind of a real life case. So you're getting those critical thinking skills. You're having fun watching these storylines. You're getting like into it and you're learning techniques along the way. Espen, did you have anything you, I know you were frustrated about <laughs> current CTFs. Yeah, you, you, you made the, uh, the, a good argument for why a case is awesome. Um, I guess from like a training perspective, I experienced that I would teach and I would be at classroom trainings myself and I would have awesome teachers uh, teach me new OSIN stuff. And I would go home and I would get my, I would get going on my case and I would be like, okay, how do I, I how do I apply what I just learned? Um, it was hard to take the techniques and tools and resources that we were shown in a classroom environment and apply it to the real world. So that's kind of what prompted me to, to make the case, uh, um, uh, scenario based training where instead of focusing on the exact tools the exact resources and methods you'll be needing we we uh, try to focus on the case itself uh, so you get a feeling for what it's like to have a boss in OSINT so you have a stakeholder uh, as we call it so you have someone who will give you tasks as you solve our cases. Uh, you have someone supporting you along the way, and it's very clear what you need to accomplish to be successful in the case and the scenario that you're working in. And that's, I guess, the key element of case is to put you in a situation that feels really re uh, real and everything you do in the scenario is based on things we see in the wild. Many of the challenges that we provide are based on real techniques that we do uh, apply ourselves in real world casework. Uh, and you will uh, be um, familiar with uh, the type of techniques you need to apply to be successful uh, with your own cases. I guess that the, that's the pitch. And and Joe knows how I feel about teaching nothing but tools. Um, I, I, I like to teach the methodology behind how to use the tools, like Espen said. And I feel like a lot of times 
in these trainings, you get a list of tools or even on the internet. If you're, if you're looking like, Hey, how do I do OSINT? You find lists of tools everywhere. So then you sit down and you're like, okay, I have this list of tools and I have this case I want to do. How do I, how do these two meet? What am I looking for? What is the, what is the pivot from this tool to like providing something of value? For sure. And we see on, on our discord, like every day, every week, people come in and they say, hi, I'm new to OSINT. Which tools do I need? Which right. is the, the wrong way to go about it. You need to flip your thinking. Uh, and also, as someone who's, who may be intermediate in OSINT, uh, it's kind of hard to practice all the tools and resources that you do know you need. So, like, where do you go to, to practice in a safe environment where you know you're safe, uh, you know you have some some uh, someone looking out for your OPSEC? Uh, it's, yeah, just a safe environment, uh, and that's what we're trying to provide. And with a traditional CTF, you get, you know, a question and then a, another question that's completely different. Very few have a, an ongoing storyline, and even fewer, if any, have, like, a, a full media uh scenario of of a real world experience um i think i think that that's fun and it gets you like into the into the case 100 percent. and you know just to kind of interject my experiences with training as well uh you hit the nail on the head ray because we are kindred spirits in that we don't i don't like teaching a list of tools because too many times I've been burned. I've had a training and I mean, I'll I'll use Recon NG as an example. And yes, I did just release a Recon NG course a while back, but it's an on-demand course. I can verify that things still work and it's not that big of a deal. And it's just a topical framework. I don't foresee that tool going away anytime soon. But from my own experience, a few years ago, I had a Recon NG course. I ran an update on Kali. It moved it from Python 2 to Python 3. All the syntax changed. Uh, Some of you may remember that. And about 20 minutes into the training, I realized that my slides were now useless. So I just had to stop the training and refund everyone their money. (laughs) And and I was that day years old when I learned, be very cautious (laughs) about teaching tools. Well, we saw that with Facebook graph search too. I mean, every, everybody relied on on that to work, and then when it broke, nobody knew how to how to function yeah. in their daily jobs. Or if you want to go back even further, you know, circa 2017, I was given talks about extracting latitude and longitude out of Facebook Live Map. I mean, Facebook Live Map's not even a thing anymore. So yeah, so you know, fast forwarding, going, you know, approximately four years. As the Ascension has evolved, I've moved away from focusing on tools. If you look at the training catalog, we we show tools in the training. It'll be like, hey, you know, you want to do this technique? Okay, well, here's the data point that you have. Here's what you were working with initially. Here are some ways that you can accomplish it. Here are some tools, but... You know, with any tool, they can go away on a moment's notice. The API can break. Terms of service can change. So many things can just change that would cause this to break if you rely on a tool. And as a byproduct of that, you know, that is a major player in the game. And I will be honest, you know, when I teach a course, I have students Always, they always ask the question, hey, I want to do more of this. Where can I get more experience? And in the past, the only things that I've really been able to say is, well, you can compete in a Trace Labs event. Volunteer, you, yeah. You can volunteer with Operation Safe Escape, National Child Protection Task Force, ATII, uh, some of the others, uh, or whatnot. But, you know, really, that's about it. And then, of course, with true crime, you've got cases like Gabby Petito. You've got cases like Summer Wells and some of the others that are there. But realistically, it's with true crime, something I've learned with the true crime world, as opposed to, I'll say, the OSINT proper world is 
they apply a different set of rules, right? They Lack are more willing. So many times they don't know. I don't think they, they haven't. To, yeah. They haven't been taught. They're not trying to be malicious. It's a scenario, you know, I've done some stuff with CrimeCon and their true crime platform, uh, Crime HQ. And really, you know, it's, it's not that they're trying to be malicious, but they're just trying to attempt to solve the problem. So they will attempt to log in or successfully log in as someone. They will call people. They'll show up at their house. They'll send text messages. And I'm not going to dispute the intelligence value of that, but it's not proper OSINT, if you will. And granted, they're not using the term OSINT. Uh, a lot of, I, I mean, I, I'll go around the table here in a second about that. But, you know, most people don't know what the word OSINT really means. Uh, but on the topic of tools, like in, this is from the Recon NG course. This is the slide. I have two slides that basically demonstrate why you don't want to rely on tools. And I mean, you know, we saw some things go away, right? We've had some tools go away. The programming language changed. So we went from Python 2 to Python 3. That basically was the end of data exploit. Uh, since they weren't able to manage that, none of the API calls work now. We saw things like PIPL or people, however you want to pronounce it, P-I-P-L, go from free to paid. And then you've got some things like Melissa and PIMIs that there's a free tier and a freemium tier. And then as laws have changed, like GDPR, COPA, and CCPA, that changes what they're allowed to do, right? And basically, that's why you need to know the, the underlying things with it. And I mean, to this slide as well, you know, a lot of the tools are labor, labors of love. You know, I wrote WikiLeaker and I wrote Decepticon bot because of what a certain space Karen has done with the Twitter API. Uh, Decepticon is pretty much null and void now. And with WikiLeaker, I've just not updated, updated it in some time. And, you know, I think the biggest punch to me and the biggest punch to the face for me is, OSINT framework is just not managed anymore to the point to where someone else has just forked the code and they're running yeah. their own version now. But it is a labor of love. Uh, some of them are sponsored by organizations such as the case with Recon NG being sponsored by Black Hills, which is safe. And then some organizations like Bishop Fox will pay for their employees to maintain tools during their work to give back to the community. But basically, you know, that's something you have to be cognizant of. And uh, another case of this is the tool um, Streisand effect. It recently, it just got deprecated for the same reason. So, yeah. Um, so on the... Sorry, I was just going to say, you mentioned the true crime crowd, and that's that's one of the things I, I personally want to tap into a little bit because I feel like there's not a lot of training that appeals to them you know, they're interested in OSINT. They do these online sleuth type cases on TikTok or, or whatever. They're interested in it, but they don't know what it is. They don't, it's, they don't have a name for it. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of hoping that case will cross that boundary a little bit and they'll become interested in it. They'll figure out that it's OSINT and they'll learn some of the ethical boundaries that we have on our side. And I think, I think there's a lot of potential in the true crime crowd to become good OSINT analysts once they have like a name for it and they know what it is and, and a guideline. Exactly. And that's exactly where I was kind of going with this. You know, my origin story for getting into OSINT proper was I had Justin Seitz on my old podcast back in, I think, 2016. I thought we were going to be talking about Python and he starts talking about doing all this stuff with like Infoga and Imaga and all this stuff. And he's like, OSINT, OSINT, OSINT. I was like, you keep saying that word, but what does it mean? And then once he explained it, I was like, oh, I've been doing that for years. And he's like, yeah, we all have. So do either of you, I guess we'll start with you, Zuin. Um, do you have a light bulb or epiphany moment for getting into the world of OSINT? Oh, yeah. I was on IRC back in the day, and people were doing OSINT. You're dating yourself now. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> uh, yeah, so so people were doing OSINT 
on people on each other they were trying to find social media profiles they were trying to find ips domains connected yeah they did did a lot of stuff um but they referred to it as a recon um not even cyber recon just recon um and that's what got me hooked in in the first place and then someone somewhere i actually can't remember when it was but i i found the osint word and I ended up in the uh, bug hunting crowd. Uh, uh, so that's kind of my origin story that I did it from a cybersecurity perspective, um, which means I didn't do as much social media intelligence. I did more, I was more focused on devices uh, and resources than, than people. So the people uh, stuff came uh, a bit later. But yeah, that was my my epiphany. Uh, I saw people do amazing things on IRC that I still remember uh, today. That sounds a lot like you know TikTok now. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, it was not as cool though. It's much cooler. <laughs> no, I <IRC. these> <laughs> no, it was cool. <laughs> Which one of the three of us wants to be the person to post the controversial hot take on Twitter of TikTok is nothing but video enabled IRC? <laughs> Oh, wow. I'm not starting that fight. (laughs) But yeah, uh, that was my entry into it. And uh, ever since, I've been been hooked uh, pretty much. Yeah, you want me to tell my my origin story? Of course. (laughs) Would that make you happy? Okay. Um, So I I was a graphic designer for 15 years-ish. I just, I love design. I love art. I love all of it. Um, I do pretty much all of the artwork for case, uh, the media, just because I like doing it. Um, But it doesn't, it it never paid very well. (laughs) And I always wanted to find something a little more technical. So I just kind of randomly picked a cybersecurity course or bachelor's degree at uh, Penn State. And I started going there. And then Um, I ran the tech club at Penn State. So we would have guests on from the field. So I would go on Twitter and use kind of my marketing background to, you know, talk to people who were big on Twitter and in the cyber world, (laughs) InfoSec, and ask them to come on and do like like this, like an interview or a presentation for the students. Um, So I got to know a lot of people that way. And I, I met Patrick Laverty from layer eight and he gave me some free tickets to come to layer eight um, which is an OSINT conference OSINT social engineering conference um so I went there with a few classmates um still had no idea what OSINT was um had no idea what I wanted to do in cybersecurity because it is such a broad field um but I had met a lot of people in the field so I had like I had some connections that way um and when I went to layer eight Trace Labs was there and I mean, this was two, three years ago, and I played in an event at Trace Labs, and I was like, I don't know what this is, but this took, like, my true crime love and the technical cybersecurity stuff I was doing and, like, mashed them together into one, and it just, it was, like, a perfect fit. So I, I like, I ran home, (laughs) and I just started, like, looking everything up. And I was thinking, like, I really want to be in this. How do I make myself look like an expert? I, you know, that's what I want to be, an expert in OSINT. So I started just writing blogs to, like, teach myself concepts. Um, I would just pick a topic that I wanted to learn about, write a blog on it, and just post it for myself. Um, But people started reading them. And I posted one on Maritime, and I got a lot of feedback on that. And I started to pivot into Maritime. And I do a whole lot of maritime OSINT now. Um, And I just started talking at conferences and it just kind of rolled from there. (laughs) So it was, it was kind of just like a happenstance situation where I fell into OSINT. Perfect. And I think, I think that layer eight is where we actually met in person because you're one of no, the I think f- it was Atlanta. I think we met in Atlanta. Uh, maybe could have been because I've I've been to every in person layer eight as well. I think we may have briefly talked there, but definitely hacker halted as well. Yes. Um, 
So, yeah, uh, to that to that end, though, I mean, OSINT to me is very accessible to all just because you don't sure. Can you can you open a Python interpreter or a Jupyter notebook or sling some Golang or JavaScript and do some heavy lifting with OSINT? Yeah, absolutely. But do I know <laughs> I don't I do mean, any of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, to that same end, can I do some of that stuff? As long as we're talking about Python, I'm okay. If we get into like Golang and JavaScript, not as much. But, you know, some of the most dangerous people, so to speak, in the OSINT world that I have encountered, uh, you being one of them, I don't, I don't know if you've heard, Ray, but you are on my list of people who, quite frankly, terrify me, which is a term of endearment. <laughs> is it but a short list or a long list? It's a relatively short list. <laughs> um, you, Chris Kubeka, Jenny Radcliffe, Michael Basil, uh, those are the top four that come to mind right now. <laughs> well, that's a good list to be on. I mean, not just because it scares you, but because those are a lot of amazing people. <laughs> yeah, indeed. But, you know, some of the people, like, just some of the people I've seen in Trace Labs events or students of classes that just come in and absolutely run roughshod, they do it from a browser. You don't need the fancy stuff. I mean, yes. can you do cool stuff with that? Yeah, absolutely. But do you need to script yourself out of a job? No, because even you know, hitting a hot button topic right now, and, and I'm going to post this as a question, with, with AI coming the way it is with GPT-4, GPT-3.5, chat GPT, Dolly, all of that fun stuff, you know, will it ever augment human analysis? I don't, personally, I don't think so. No. But, it's like anything, it supports it. Right. It's like with RSA just around the corner, let me spoil some vendor time from the vendor floor. Nothing is going to fully augment people. If you think of software, appliances, tools as the solution, you're in the wrong frame of mind. You want to think of it as an amplifier, right? A force amplifier, if you will. And that's where a lot of people get hung up. And that goes back to what we were saying earlier about, you know, Here's the top 10 OSINT tools. And I, I have to laugh every time I see that list because there's a couple of tools on it that I'm like, mm, I don't, I wouldn't call that a top tool. And then there are some that I see and I'm just like, um, that tool's been deprecated for a couple of years. Well, that's yeah. what they just scrape the tools and post them. Um, I did want to mention one thing though, because we're talking about, you know, Python and technical OSINT. Um, I do. I get a lot of women who reach out to me and they're, they're like, I don't know how to start. Do I need to know all of this stuff? Because, you know, t technology is very uh, filled with men. I'll just, I'll just say it. it's a sausage party in, in tech. And I think a lot of women feel insecure about that or their knowledge in like entering the field. So I just want to say that you do not need to know all that. I don't know all that. Um, don't be afraid to just start. And if you end up doing Python stuff, that's great. If you don't, there's still plenty of room for you. Um, don't be scared away. And also, OSINT might seem very male-oriented uh, in the open public space. But I can tell you in the intelligence industry, some of the best people there are women, oh, and yeah. sadly, sadly, they cannot be at conferences. They cannot do Twitter. They can't be interviewed. But yeah, some of the best ones are women. So yeah, yeah, I've I've heard I've heard that just skills wise, you know, we're better at OSINT. But well, I'll save that argument for another <laughs> podcast. But also on the <laughs> on the top ten uh, tools, I want to ask like top ten for who and for what. Um, I like we we talked about browser based OSINT, which I think is much what I do. Uh, I think I have one tool or maybe a couple that I run pretty much for every case. But other than that, I am in the browser. I am looking at online resources and I'm applying manual techniques on websites. 
if you think you're not finding what you're looking for because you don't have the right tool, you're going about it the wrong way, I think. I, I agree because within intelligence in general, whether that be social engineering or OSINT, because let's face it, social engineering is really human intelligence. And it's really not, do you have the right tool? It's, are you asking the right question? It's not what you ask, but it's how you ask it. And that's highly applicable to search engines if you are going with, say, Google, Yandex, Gaburu, or whatever. But sometimes you just have to learn the correct way to frame what it is that you are pushing for. And to the point that you were both making, um, honestly, OSINT is the people behind the scenes that you don't see. I totally agree with that sentiment. And I'm going to amplify that further with the same thing with social engineering, right? And with social engineering, I was having a conversation with someone via Twitter DMs yesterday. And a lot of the stuff, a lot of the successful techniques in social engineering, women immediately can be more successful because they there's already a stereotype. It's not a true stereotype, but you know, it's like if a woman says, Oh, I need help, you have a bunch of men flocking over to help the woman, the damsel in distress. And then they'll just open the door for her, whether it be for ulterior motives or just to be nice, or they were raised that way. And then bam, she's got access to the building. I mean, yeah, you know, there, there are some people that you should be nice to because it's the right thing to do. There's some people you should be nice to because they can make your life miserable. There's some people you should never be nice to. And one of them is Jenny Radcliffe. And I say that in jest because <laughs> never be nice and hold a door open for her unless the building is surrounded by a spider moat, because I know she's terrified of spiders. I hear she has a new book out as well. Uh, yeah. She does. Um, on the topic of Python, uh, very quickly, while we're in the mode of uplifting OSINT training and OSINT trainers, if you want to do Python training, this is where I initially learned Python from. The master course, yes, this is $1,000. It is Canadian dollars, so it's not as much as you would think. But if you just want to learn Python, if you go to automating OSINT slash Python hyphen course, I'm putting the link in Twitch. This is Justin Seitz, the founder of Hunchly. Uh, he's also a Bellingcat contributor. He's an OSINT monster as well. He's also on that list of people who terrify me. He's one of he the has... nicest people in InfoSec. Agreed. Um, you can purchase a Python only course for 50 bucks. And this is a place to learn basic Python. And it's an on-demand course. And if you reach out to him and say, hey, I need help with this or just tweet about it, you can actually get the help you need. So if you are getting into OSINT or you're trying to advance your OSINT chops and you want to do Python and you're looking at Coursera, Udemy, Pluralsight, all of those, nothing against those training providers. But the thing about that is they are written for Python developers. They may teach you things that you will never need to know for OSINT. This is geared exclusively to OSINT. So it's talking about things like parsing JSON, making API calls, referencing things in arrays, and things like that. Things that are actually immediately important to someone dealing with OSINT. 9.99. How many Canadian flannels is that? Uh, well, this course is only forty nine ninety nine, so you know the one probably. Yeah, so if we want to talk U.S. dollars, that's like thirty six dollars. So you really can't beat that. So I, if, you, if you want to go that route, that's a great way to go as well. I also recommend learning Python the hard way, which is a book that is really good. Yes, I think that's uh, uh, book? a no starch book, if I recall correctly. That might be true, yeah. Uh, if I if I recall correctly, that one is quite frequently featured 
in humble bundles. And yes. that's another good route to go. If you are looking for something, if you're trying to learn something, maybe we should try to put together um if we maybe we should try to put together an OSINT humble bundle. I don't know. I, I hear that they do well. I hear they do well, and I hear that if my intelligence serves me correctly, I think Ray and me at a minimum are connected to the person behind it. I'm not sure about you, Zuin. Um but literally, you know, you can go in here and get books and it all goes to charity as well. So to that end, like right here is Linux. If you want to learn Linux, that's a way to go. Cookbooks for coders. But, you know, just be on the lookout. It's nothing unusual for there to be like a Python or a no starch humble bundle that has uh, Python the hard way, automate the boring stuff with Python, all of that kind of stuff. So I met Justin Sites at Hacker Halted. Uh, I didn't meet him there, but I was at a booth and they had swag out. And like me and the, the other students I was with tried to look at the swag and they were like, no, these are for customers. And they like pushed us out of the way. I posted it on Twitter and Justin's like, ah, screw them. And he sent me all his books. That, <laughs> He's a super nice guy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and from the chat, Access OSEN saying, this is uh, just best getting an idea of something you want to make, then try, and then look up the specific things to accomplish it. Yeah, I mean, the number of the number of tools that I have made and not released, just because it's like, I want to do this, I want to do that. Decepticon bot was literally just that. I was trying to learn more about data science. I was trying to learn more about, like, the machine learning and automation perspective of it. And I was working with Operation Safe Escape, which, you know, they seek to disrupt uh, domestic violence. They want to help victims get out and stay out. And with that, there's the client care aspect of it that goes beyond just the getting them out. And if there are abusers trying to interact with them on social media, it's hard for them to live their best life because they have to relive that trauma. So they can either completely subject themselves to that trauma or they can create a new account. And then once their old account goes dead, then the abuser is going to find them again or possibly find them again. So Decepticon bot served the purpose of connecting to the Twitter API to post junk posts on someone's behalf. So they could abandon that account and have the abuser think that it's still active and then they could go off and have another account, live their best life and hope the uh, basically delay or hope that the abuser doesn't catch on. That's but, a great tool. Yeah. Yep. So we can, we can give it a moment of silence now that the, the Twitter API <laughs> is really expensive. And I, I was just planning uh, to rewrite it instead of using a recurrent neural network to do it. I was actually going to use chat GPT. Mm. But, yeah. Yeah. And on, sorry. Yeah, I was gonna just gonna say that on the point of tools, um, I don't think people talk about this too much, but there are roles in OSINT where you're a tool maker. So you can, for instance, combine data science and OSINT and only be the developer slash tool person on like an intelligence team or. Uh, an investigative unit. So if that's your, uh, if that's what you like to do, make tools, find techniques, methods of extracting information, there are roles out there where you can. Oh, for sure. I work with people who do just that. Yeah. And I mean, to that end, that's. I'm not going to say entirely. I don't want to. I don't want to devalue their experience, but. Really, that's kind of how Jake Krebs got his start uh, pretty heavily. He was just writing OSINT tool after OSINT tool. He was identifying a problem and using his developer experience to actually get that problem solved. Uh, now, how much how much he's able to maintain them now, I don't know. But that's how he got his start. So if you want to go that route, that's definitely something... Uh, worth taking a look at um yeah and 
uh, for, I mean, we're very US based when it comes to tools. So as the only non American here, I'll say that if you do OSINT in small countries, if you do it in Europe, you're going to have to make tools on your own uh, to a certain extent. Because uh, we don't have people, but we may have something similar and there might not be any tools for that. So Maybe you'll need to write a code snippet yourself to to extract some data, or you find an interesting endpoint on a local resource. So it is good to know how to do that stuff. Look, I'm I'm basically Norwegian now. Okay. <laughs> no, you're not. Say something in Norwegian, and we'll see. I can only say spiders. I can only say other cop. <laughs> hey, I mean. I, I can tell you members of Demu Borgir and Mayhem and uh, Behemoth and all of that, if that counts. <laughs> that helps. I can say, like, I'm eating spiders. <laughs> That's, like, the one thing I remember. <laughs> um, yeah. So w- with that, you know, with OSINT, you, it, it is more of a mentality, in, in my opinion. It does. We don't necessarily need to rely on the tools, right? So to to that particular end, how how does one get themselves kind of into that frame of mind? How do they, what skills can complement that? Um, and, and how can we pull from the mainstream as we do it? Oh, wow, that's uh, quite a topic. Um, I, I guess like the, the main skill that I try to teach is the way you need to think to get to the right question you need to ask yourself. So for instance, Ray Kill Joe, um, that's a very high level, uh, type of situation. And to solve that murder, uh, just assuming we don't know that Ray killed Joel yet, we got to ask ourselves a bunch of questions. Uh, and if you trickle down, way down to the OSINT stuff in that case, you'll find some OSINT-based questions you can ask yourself. So maybe your boss comes and say, can you please do OSINT on Ray? We need, we need some information on Ray. Uh, but what does that even mean? Can, like a sentence that I often got when I did intelligence is that they said, can you do OSINT on this person? What does that even mean? So I think the skill is to take that question or take the boss or stakeholders question and fracture it into smaller bits. So you can start with where would Ray be on social media? Okay, she's in her 30s or 40s. Typically they are found on Facebook. So maybe I'll go on Facebook first and then I'll try to ask myself all of those questions that will essentially help me answer the bigger question of why or who killed Joe. Uh, And I think maybe that was a really bad explanation, but that's the way I go go about it. No, I think that makes sense. And I, I mean, to bring it back to case, that's kind of what we're trying to achieve is to break down questions Um, that you can answer through actually performing the OSINT um, while experiencing an interesting uh, case. Like you're, you're immersed, you are the journalist, you are the uh, private investigator or um, lawyer or, you know, whatever that our case, because we'll, we'll be making and putting out a whole bunch of scenarios and they'll all be focused on different aspects of OSINT. So one might be a private investigator. So you get to take that role. The first one is a journalist. So you're an investigative journalist. So you're taking on that role. One might be a detective, you know? So as we put these together, something is going to hit your interests, like what you want to do. And then you'll get to step into the, their shoes and kind of see what it might be like. Yes, and we try to give you a reason why you're looking for a particular piece of information. So there's a sense of uh, accomplishment when you, for instance, geolocate a video or you find someone's username. It has a lot of meaning to the story. Uh, So instead of, you know, with, with a normal CTF, you would be given a picture and the question might be, which city was this taken in? And then you solve it and you're given like 100 points, thumbs up, 
good job, but there's no context to that challenge. Like, where did the image come from? Was it found in social media? Uh, did someone send it to, to us? Like, there's no context around the challenge. And that's kind of what we're trying to, to give uh, the, the student. And, and that's one of the things that I actually really liked and I still like about Trace Labs events, there's a certain level of context with it, but at the same time, it's also an open-ended book. You can have 10 different teams and they tell 10 completely different stories. But a couple of things that just popped up into my mind that I think leads to the success of a no sent practitioner and coming off the heels, you know, just earlier today, I did a webinar about TikTok and, you know, that's a very politically charged conversation, especially in the United States right now. But the two things that I think that one needs to adapt to be successful within OSINT is you need to establish a mindset of this is outside of just your little microcosm. So I'm just as guilty as the next person. I do tend to use US centric tools and techniques. And that's something I want to get past, but I just haven't at this time. And to that end, you know, you've got to have a global mentality, but going further than just that global mentality, you have to be able to acknowledge and to some degree mitigate your own biases, right? Because in the U.S., you may be politically biased to one side or the other, but when it comes time to actually investigate or critically assess something, you need to be able to acknowledge it and move past it. Would, would you all tend to agree with that? Yes. And, Absolutely. And actually, like a lot of our scenarios are going to be international uh, based just because, you know, he's in Norway, I'm here, we have a few other uh, ideas of um, other countries we're going to put scenarios into. So one thing we got when we did our our beta test, uh, a lot of the good feedback was um, we kind of put people on the ground in the area and let them like walk around and experience like what the area is around our scenario. Like if, it, if it's a crime happening in a certain city, you know, you you'll get to experience the city from the ground level and it, it kind of immerses you. And people seem to really enjoy that. Um, so if you think about that in another country, like maybe you'll get to like enjoy Norway via your computer while solving a murder. <laughs> yeah, I think we can reveal now that the the upcoming scenarios are set in the UK and in Norway, and they are going to be traveling all over Europe. So you'll get to do OSINT all around. It's not going to be only U.S. based. So that's fun. Yeah. And I, I will tease. I think you have the picture somewhere, Joe, for the new one. Yeah. So um, we're working on this new one called Betrayal, and it's going to be a free one. So it's going to kind of allow you to test out a scenario before you pay for it. Um, it's about a murder case. Uh, a man is on trial for murdering his wife and you're trying to figure out if he did it or not. Um, as a private investigator. As a private investigator working for a, a law, well, the DA. So yes. you'll, you'll get to step into that role and um, investigate. In for my time matter. watching all the true crime on A&E, Oxygen, Law and Order and all of that, I'm going to say that it was definitely Charles that did it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I have watched so much true crime that I keep a spreadsheet of what I've watched. So I don't rewatch it. <laughs> so I pull a lot of stuff from real, real true crime, but I mix them all together. So you'll never be able to figure out like which one I'm using. Yeah, but, but you will see than... hints. If you are a true crime person, you will see hints of real cases in there. There's nothing worse than being 20 minutes into a true crime show and being like, Oh, it's this dude. <laughs> Man, I watched that before. Right. Yeah. That's so, why I have to keep a spreadsheet because I, I watch too many. Yeah. Actually, a guy um, I went to high school with, uh, he was my best friend's next door neighbor. 
he actually uh, he's the ex he's a local extra in a lot of the true crime shows. So you'll randomly see him on social media and be <laughs> like, hey, you might want to watch um, uh, the first 48 hours um, around such and such time. Uh, I look really guilty. And then um, <laughs> William Tokarski, he's on the show. Welcome to Flatch. We are friends on social media and communicate from time to time. I saw him on a show and uh, I was like, hey, is this you? And I sent him the picture. He's like, yeah, that's me. I was like, <laughs> oh, cool. And about an hour later, he messages me again. He's like, did I look like I did it? <laughs> and I was like, oh, OK. Um, but yeah, it's I he's, he's what, what's your people. favorite true crime show? <sighs> like if you got to pick one. I'll ask both of you. Well, mine is going to be Norway, so no That's one fine. is going to no one is going to know. Yeah, but if we're all those same people. We can look it up. We're Google. Yeah. Google exists. Yeah, the Marianne or or Marianne case from Norway back in the seventies or eighties, which is one of our most uh, famous cases here in Norway. That's my my favorite show. The truth about Marianne, I think, is the name. Mm. I'll have to watch it. That's part of me learning Norwegian is I like to watch so many uh, uh, Norwegian crime dramas that I want to be able to watch them in Norwegian. Yeah, and I definitely binged a lot when I was working on uh, Dark Waters and I'm still binging them when I'm working on uh, other scenarios. So yeah, as Ray said, if you watch true crime, you you might recognize some some things. I think I like my favorite cop drama is Joe Kenda, um, the ho- Homicide Hunter. Uh, I love the Homicide Hunter. That, yeah. fan, honestly, I like, in terms of shows, it would probably be I Almost Got Away With It or The First 48. But I really like watching Marsha Clark's shows where she's breaking stuff down Mm, yeah those those are good um because with some true crime it's you know it's either too centric on the the event itself or on someone's opinion or having a talking head shouting at you um but i like the shows that really just break it down um you know from the I'll ask this question. Which is your favorite Law & Order franchise? Uh, it depends on the year because the the cops change. You know, I like traditional Law & Order from way back. And then SVU uh, a little bit back. Nowadays, not so much. Yeah, Law & Order just started. It was sent in Norway in the early 2000s, I think. So I haven't watched it too much. Did you know that the word OSINT actually exists in Law and Order Organized Crime? Really? That is my current favorite. It was in season one, I believe. Um, Hmm. They were doing a... A cryptocurrency investigation jet was so if you watch law and order organized crime jet is kind of the OS- she's the mr robot of the team but she does osint and uh social engineering and that kind of stuff the word osint has popped up but she does a lot more than just osint cool yeah they, they don't like to say osint because it doesn't sound as dramatic as like yeah something else they could call we're doing cyber reconnaissance and then they both yeah. type on the computer at the same time yeah, then yeah. they run app get update um <laughs> yeah, i feel like the most of the time the the sort of lab geek the stereotypical lab geek uh, on, on all law enforcement shows they try to say that they're more of a hacker type but in reality i always felt like they were more osin oriented yeah, well, like with NCIS, for example, with McGee, like he had a, his degrees from MIT, he can hack and all of that. But Abby, the lab tech, is really 
like she's got some chops, but she really has the OSINT skill as well. Um, and not to not to take away from Ducky as well, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, when they enhance on an image, that's something we do, right? Oh, yeah. Well, enhance, enhance. <laughs> our, our computers don't make the same noises as theirs, but yeah. Yeah. People, people. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so I, I focus a lot of true crime into, just from, <laughs> that's what's in my brain, <laughs> I put into these scenarios. Yeah, it is uh, easy to get inspired by, by the things you see. So when we can take something good from true crime or like our favorite movie and mix it up with OSINT stuff we see in the real world, uh, it's uh, going to be a great scenario. And I think when we are successful in making something good, people forget that it's a fake story. They are truly immersed. Yep, and that's the idea. So we have a 15% off coupon code for all of your followers. OSINT for you. Um, and on the last until April 29th upcoming, we have what well, the dark water scenario is out now. It's what's the time on that, Espen? Like how long does it take to complete? About 15 hours. Okay, 15 hours long. You're in the shoes of a journalist, investigative journalist. It's an environmental crime kind of thriller and then we have upcoming the free scenario called Betrayal that's going to be out soon uh, about a husband that murders his wife or is on trial for murdering his wife. And you have to, you're a private investigator working for the prosecutor trying to prove whether he did it or not. Um, and that'll be a free one. And then Aspen, do you want to talk about the, the other ones that are coming out? Yeah, we, we aren't ready to share too much about those yet, but I can tell you that they're set in the UK and it's going to be a missing person scenario uh, where you are a uh, OSINT analyst working for the NCA in the UK. Uh, the other one uh, is set in Norway and that's going to be, it's going to be around murders in, in Norway. That's all I'll tell you right now. So um, again, yeah, the code is OSIN for you. It's fifteen percent off. Yes, and uh, we we touched on this a bit earlier, but our scenarios is not instead of classroom training. It's not something you should do as your only input for OSIN training. It's meant to be a. Uh, practical training grounds where you can have fun. You can try out the things that you have uh, learned from from Joe and others. Um, it's not timed. It's like not work timed. at your own pace. <laughs> it's not about the points. You are gonna be stuck, but please remember, there's lots to be learned from from being stuck. You're gonna have fun, even though you're gonna be be stuck sometimes. And we on our have... Discord server, we have like a case section where you can go in and ask. You yes, know, people to work with you or, you know, ask questions, whatever. Yes, you're not alone. We are there to support you. If you have questions, you can reach out to us directly or in the chat. Uh, yeah. Ray, tell us about the book. Yes. So I've spent the last year of my life writing. It was supposed to be 400 pages. It uh, appears that they kept all my words and it's 450 now. <laughs> um, it's called... Deep Dive, Exploring the Real-World Value of Open Source Intelligence, and it releases May 9th. You can pre-order it now, um, wherever books are sold, Amazon, Wiley, um, Barnes & Noble. It's a, it's a general book on OSINT. Um, I cover methodology. Uh, I mention a few tools, but I'm not like focused on tools. Uh, a lot of it is methodology. I start with um, kind of explaining what open source intelligence is, the intelligence cycle, kind of, you know, the adversarial mindset, operational security, things like that. And then the second part shifts into diving deeper into concepts, subject intelligence, social media analysis. We talk about business and organizational intelligence Big section on transportation because I love it. Boats, ships, uh, planes, rail, cars, trucks. Um, and then critical infrastructure 
and industrial stuff. And then financial intelligence, crypto and um, NFTs. And uh, I fill it with lots of case studies and like real life examples. So you learn the concepts, the methodology, and then you see how it was used in a case or, or an example, something that really happened. And then I have pivot charts in there to show you how we work through the cases or how you might take a concept and pivot through to more information. Um, you can find more information about the book on raybaker.net. Um, I think Joe has it up. It, it is a really good book, even though I am the tech editor. It's not like any awesome book that is out there. It would be a great uh, book to get for uh, case scenarios. It's going to help you a lot. Yeah. He wouldn't lie. He's Norwegian. They, they yeah, I lie. would tell you if it sucked. I promise. <laughs> If you are interested in on-demand training, check out The Ascension Academy. Visit academy.theoscension.com. If you're interested in purchasing courses from The Ascension, you can do so in a variety of ways. The Ascension Store, which is at theoscension.com slash courses slash store. You can purchase bundles, individual courses, and placeholders here. If you would like a custom bundle, please email bundles at theoscension.com for custom bundles or questions. You can follow us on Twitch. OSINT.MOBI slash Twitch is the redirect. OSINT.MOBI slash YouTube is the YouTube redirect. And also we maintain a couple of communities. On Discord, we maintain the Ascension Discord, which is OSINT.MOBI slash Discord. And we are also members of OSINT Intelligence on LinkedIn, which you can join via OSINT.MOBI slash OSINT Intelligence. There are the links to my social media as well as the Ascensions. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like this video, comment, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell.